welcome to the Peter King Podcast, a down the stretch of the NFL season podcast with many things to discuss with my good friend Miles Simmons from NBC. A quick look at our rundown. We're going to be joined by Kirk Herbstreit. I recorded an interview with him on Monday. And one of the things I really like about Kirk Herbstreit is that I think of things I want to talk to him about, and then I, I don't get to even a third of them because he's so interesting and leads it in so many different directions. So uh, I think you'll really enjoy this. One of my uh, favorite conversations I've had with someone uh, this year for the podcast. So we'll hear from Kirk Herbstreet in a few minutes. <clears throat> and in the meantime, we're going to talk about the Drew Locke miracle in Seattle on Monday night, where it leaves the Philadelphia Eagles. And <clears throat> I don't think either Miles or uh, me would have thought at the beginning of this uh, of this run, you know, mid-season, late-season struggle of the Philadelphia Eagles, that they might be looking at playing the postseason all on the road. It's kind of crazy, but it could happen. We'll also discuss <clears throat> the resurgent Buffalo Bills, the non-resurgent Dallas Cowboys, the guy who right now both Miles and me is, or both Miles and I, I I'm getting the the uh, pronouns totally screwed up, but the guy who we think should be in the lead for coach of the year at this point, and. You know, just a couple of other notes as we go down the stretch of this NFL season. Miles Simmons, welcome. And what goes through your mind when you see Drew Locke drive the Seattle Seahawks? And Drew Locke, who hadn't played great up to that point. Drew Locke, who drives the Seattle Seahawks downfield. Huge completion uh, to DK Metcalf. And then, obviously, a great throw to win the game and put a dagger in the Philadelphia Eagles to Jackson Smith and Jigba. What are you thinking? Well, I'll tell you, Peter, you know, I was covering the Raiders in 2019 for the Las Vegas review journal. And in week 17, the Raiders went to Denver, played the Broncos and drew lock played a solid game, right? It was one of those where he was still a rookie at the time. And you're like, Hey man, he played well enough for the Broncos to win. And there's obviously the now famous shot of him wrapping Jeezy on the sideline. And I thought, A, that's some stuff that I would do if I were a quarterback, and that's pretty cool. And B, this guy has some traits. And I don't know if they're really going to translate to him being a good quarterback or not, but at that time, I was like, you know what? He's got something to him. And I think a lot of that stuff came back in that game that he had on Monday night where he's making the throws that he had to make at the time that he had to make them. And it's tough for a guy, which we saw in that interview that he did with Lisa Salters after the game where it's, you know, A, you don't necessarily know if you're playing. B, it's been a long time since he's been a starter. Yeah. And I think with good reason, you know, when you've been through the kinds of things that he's been through over the course of his football life and the course over the course of his NFL career, when you have a moment like that where your back's against the wall, and you've got to drive down 92 yards to effectively save the Seahawks season. I mean, that is a really, really big moment. And I, it's one of those games, man, where I'm just like, gosh, I love football. I just love it so much because yeah. you never know what you're going to see. And when you can see what it means to someone in that kind of moment, it just makes you love it even more. So I, I, I was really happy for Drew Locke and the success that he was able to have last night. Look, you know, Miles, I, I found myself thinking, I'll confess, I went to bed at halftime. I was a wreck, uh, kind of a travel nightmare coming back to home to New York after being in Foxborough on Sunday, Providence Sunday night. And, uh, you know, we had these, you know, biblical rains in New yeah. England and in New York. So it it was uh, it was interesting getting home. But anyway, I bet. Be that as it may, I was exhausted. I went to bed at halftime and I got up, watched the highlights. And what really impressed me down the stretch is that on this 92-yard drive, 
Drew Locke was basically put up against the wall twice. Two third and tens. Mm -hmm. The first one with, oh, I don't know, like a minute to go in his own territory. It's literally season on the line. He and DK Metcalf combined for a 34-yard, you know, catch and run. And so that basically gave Seattle life. And then obviously on the pass to Smith and Jigba to win the game with uh, 25 seconds left. What really interested me about <clears throat> that pass is the confidence that a guy like Drew Locke has to have, even when the game has not really gone the way he would want it to go against a good defense. And But he knew, Shane Waldron, the offensive coordinator, also knew that the looks that they were getting from the Philadelphia Eagles, he thought there was a very good chance that one of his receivers was going to have single coverage without safety help. And as soon as he looked over the Philadelphia defense, he saw that, hey, I think there's a good chance that James Bradbury is going to be singled on Jackson Smith and Jigba. Now, assuming Smith and Jigba doesn't get erased at the line, you know, and, and really hurt by, by, you know, a physical play at the line of scrimmage, I know he can beat James Bradbury. And hand it to Drew Locke. At this moment, at this very moment, he had to know, absolutely had to know, our season is on the line and I need to make a throw right here. Now, you might say, Miles Simmons, well, wait a second, wait a second. They have a good kicker, and even if this is incomplete, they're still going to go to overtime. And here would be my rejoinder to that, that I do not want my season coming down to a 47-yard field goal attempt, and then hopefully stopping, you know, a last gas drive of the Eagles, who have one of the best deep clutch kickers in football. So I don't want to rely on giving the Eagles four plays to get into field goal range to beat me at home. That's number one. And I don't want to rely on maybe a coin flip or whatever to have to win the game in overtime. There are so many things that could go wrong if that pass to Smith and Jigba falls incomplete. So I think, as I look at it, I love the chance that Seattle took on this play. I absolutely love it. And the biggest throw of Drew Locke's life was made. And, and look... I love when guys like Drew Locke, who nobody really has faith in, is going to be a franchise quarterback. Nobody. But I love when they say, okay, I'm going to show everybody. And he just did at that moment. He did it at, at that moment. And, you know, they, they did need that touchdown. You know, I, I think that when you're Drew Locke and when you're Seattle and when you're Smith and Jigba, and I, I love the way Drew Locke put it, after the game to Lisa Salters, where it's like, hey, man, if you're one-on-one, -on -one, I'm firing you that pill. And he did. And, you know, he did it with confidence. And he also talked about in the post-game press conference um, about how Geno Smith was talking him up on the sideline. And that's something that you don't that always so cool. see. Yeah, you, you really don't always yeah. see it from a quarterback and his backup. And sometimes, you know, <clears throat> when quarterbacks get to the podium and they start talking about stuff like that, they're kind of fishtails. Because, you know, yeah, you can give credit to guys and, you know, you, you say things that sound nice. But I think that that is some of the most genuine praise that I've ever heard from a backup to the starter when you look at the reaction that they showed on the ESPN broadcast of Drew Locke and Geno Smith celebrating that pass together. And Geno Smith is doing the same backpack celebration 
that Drew Locke is doing on the field. You can tell that there is that genuine connection and that genuine feeling of, hey, I'm trying to get you to play at your at your absolute best so that our team can succeed. That's that's something that's pretty special from Geno Smith. And I thought that, you know, that relationship between him and Drew Locke really was something that absolutely benefited the Seahawks in that situation. So you you don't always see that from a quarterback, especially one who, you know, look, Geno Smith's football future with the Seattle Seahawks is not necessarily guaranteed. And so, yeah, Geno Smith is still slated to be the starter when he comes back. And I think he is the best option for Seattle for the rest of the season. But at the same time, like I said, you just don't always see something like that in that moment um, for a quarterback who is injured and then the backup who is in there. And they just had a quarterback competition to see who was going to be the starter last year. So Seattle right now, if they win out, and their three opponents are combined 15 and 27, Tennessee, Pittsburgh, Arizona. You could see them winning out, even though they have not played well. I could also see them losing one of those games. Oh. But if they win out, it's very likely that they will be the six or seven seed in the NFC. And let's talk for a minute about the Philadelphia Eagles. So not a good week for the Eagles. I mean, not a good week at all. Um, let's let's just put the cards on the table. Not a good last 14 days for the Philadelphia Eagles. They get creamed by San Francisco at home. They get creamed by Dallas on the road. They lose a game they had no business losing at Seattle, which had been on a four-game losing streak. Mm-hmm. And so, where are the Eagles right now? And I'll just say two things. They appear to be, although it's not exactly correct, they appear to be a little panicky right now. Changing defensive coordinators so late in the season and not playing well on offense, really not playing well on defense until Monday night. Then they played a pretty good game, but that all goes away when you allow a 92-yard drive in about 92 seconds to lose a game you absolutely had to have. And so, Miles, where do you think right now this leaves the Eagles? I don't think it leaves them in a good spot, Peter. And you're not in a good spot if you're changing defensive play callers because, of course, Sean decides still officially, I guess, has the defensive coordinator title, la, la, la. But if you're changing defensive play callers, then you know you're not in a good spot when it's this late in the season. And they needed to do something because their third down defense, and I'm talking about Seattle, right? Or excuse me, Philadelphia right now, their third down defense was awful. Right? When you're last in the league and you've got those yeah. kinds of pass rushers up front, there's something wrong. So they did need to do something. You already have Matt Patricia in your building. I understand why you would do that. Now, going into that last drive, Seattle was four of 12 on third down and then they gave up two big big third down conversions to end up at six of 14 so you can see that yes there was some improvement on third down over the course of the game but i don't know when you're leaving guys one-on-one -on -one for deep shots toward the end there and you're daring drew lock to 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 make those throws and to make those plays i i there's a part of me that understands it but at the same time man i mean is that really the best play on defense clearly it wasn't if we're going with the result here because that's what happened, right? You see that touchdown get made. So those are things that Seattle's got to deal with. Excuse me, Philadelphia's got to deal with going forward. The other thing too, Peter, is that Jalen Hurts is talking about guys being committed, right? And commitment. And you could tell that he was very frustrated after the loss in talking about these different kinds of things. When he was asked about two-minute situations and then goes into you know making it a broader thing about commitment there. That's not good <laughs> when your quarterback who right. is ostensibly an MVP candidate every year at this point, when he's talking about that at this point in the season, late December, that means you've got to disconnect. And I don't know if it's just coaching and quarterback or quarterback and the rest of the personnel on the offense. That's a problem. And they've got to get that right. They obviously have a chance to get that right with Giants, Cardinals, Giants over the last three games of the season. 
But when you're talking about divisional matchups and the Giants have played good games this year, there's a chance that Philadelphia could lose one of those. So this is going to be a really interesting stretch for the Eagles. Can they get right and get that the thing started back on an upward trajectory headed into the postseason? Because I frankly did not expect them to lose three in a row, especially at this time of year. Yeah, and I think there's two other things about the Eagles that would trouble me right now. Look, not the schedule. You know, they have three winnable games. You know, even the Giants with some of that uh, Tommy DeVito magic, you'd, you've got to think that the Giants are going to at least be competitive in one of those games. But if you look at the Eagles right now, you you still think, even though you say they're not playing well, Giants, Arizona, both at home and then at the Giants to finish, you like their chances to run the table, but it's kind of funny. I was thinking about this this morning. If Philadelphia finishes 13-4, and four, whether they win the division or not, the crazy thing is they could finish 13-4 and four and be pretty shaky going into the playoffs. So mm-hmm. I think they have not just to steady the ship, but I think they need to play well and in a dominant fashion down the yes. stretch yes. to knock out even a bunch of personal doubts that they have uh, coming into uh, what certainly is going to be the postseason, but coming into feeling decent about themselves in the postseason. Miles, <clears throat> we're going to take a quick break. And then on the other side, we will be joined by, or I will be joined by Kirk Herbstreet, the Amazon Prime Video color analyst for NFL Thursday Night Football. I just wanted to check in with him. See how he's doing. See how he likes the NFL. And we had one of the most wide-ranging conversations. It was fun. Talked a lot about dogs. You get a good view if you watch this on on the NBC Sports YouTube channel. You get a good view of Ben, the golden retriever, who now, I think, might be the most famous golden retriever in the United States. You get a really good view of him taking a nap. So at the feet of Kirk Herbstreet. Um, and you know, we talk about a lot of things and I think you'll be surprised and educated by what he finds to be, uh, the thing that has really hit him the most about doing two years of pro football and the difference maybe between pro football and college football as he sees it right now. I think he makes some good points. So on the other side of our break, you'll listen to Kirk Herbstreet, and then Miles and I will be back for part two of our review of week 15 and preview of week 16. So happy to be joined this week by Kirk Herbstreet on the podcast. And Kirk, we've got a thousand things to get to in 20 minutes to get to them, but there's something very, very personal uh, that I wanted to ask you about. Number one, as you can see, hold on one second, I am an Ohio Bobcat. So I don't really follow college football very closely. And I look in the uh, online every Saturday or the paper on Sunday to see How did the Bobcats do yesterday? But I'm not close to the program or anything like that. So I said, hey, Bobcats are in the Myrtle Beach Bowl on Saturday. And uh, I'm going to watch part of the game. I'm I'm working here at home. And so I'm going to watch part of the game. So I turned on the game and I said, hey, wait a second. Where's our quarterback? Where's our where's our our running back who rushed for a jillion yards? Where's our receivers? Where where's our all Mac? uh, I think linebacker there. And so during early in the telecast, they say they all went into the transfer portal, including the friggin' starting quarterback. And we really don't have I to the I didn't think we had another quarterback who was competitive because this guy Curtis Rourke played all the time but you know i just i just said okay look 
nobody cares really about Mac football. It's not going to, it's not the biggest event. It's not anything. But I mean, I just thought to myself, isn't there a time and place for everything? Can't players <coughs> who committed to their team finish one season before they, you know, abdicate the throne? And I just, I just wanted to hear your thoughts about what has happened in this whole transfer por transfer portal business. Uh, boy, we only have twenty minutes, so this is a this is a tough answer. Um, you know, college football has probably endured more change in the last two years than the previous fifty years. Yeah. Um, and I think part of what you're describing is, I think part of you know the part of the madness of what's happening. If you throw in on top of that the NIL that it typically lures players from those those mid tier programs. If you have a great quarterback, if you have a great running back, and you're at a MAC school um, or a Mountain West school, chances are if he's an underclassman, he's going to get basically recruited up to to one of the bigger schools, which I'm not a fan of. I'm just telling you that's that's kind of where it is currently anyway. And um, then you have guys that opt out. You know, even if they're done playing college, they think they're going to go to the NFL, they'll, they'll opt out uh, of the bowl game. So I, I lived in an era where the bowl games were um, – it was a celebration a of the season you yeah. had. It was kind of a big deal. You, you know, you – you really look forward to going and playing in a bowl game. You'd get a little bit of freedom, which you never had as a player, because every every minute of every day, you live a very regimented life. And so you go to a bowl game, you practice in the morning, you'd be done with working out by around noon. And you'd have four or five, six hours in Orlando, Florida, or Dallas, Texas, or Pasadena, or wherever you were. And you and your buddies could go out and enjoy yourself, you know, for, for about four or five days. And it was it was like... And then there was pride on the line when you played in the bowl game. And, and it's just nowadays that's that's just not a thing. It's uh it's it's all about the transfer portal, it's all about NIL, it's all about creating um basically money and leverage for yourself. And um I, I hate that it's doing that to the game. I really do, because I, I miss I miss those postseason games. Um being a part of a team and and playing one more time together. I, you know, I, I used to really love that aspect of the college game. I guess <clears throat> as far as the transfer portal goes, so I see Curtis Rourke went to Indiana. I, I have no, no problem with a guy yeah. better himself. Uh, it, it, absolutely fine. And, and plus you should be able to go play where you want. Mm -hmm. I get that. Yeah. Um, I guess the timing of it just yeah, wasn't. I'm with. You. I think I think coaches feel that too. Uh, all of this happening in December, you know, you, you, you're trying to prepare for a bowl game. Your party roster's leaving. Uh, you're trying to recruit. By the way, the, the high school recruiting signing periods up in, in another week or so, or another few days. So you're think about that. I mean, you're trying to close on a recruiting class. You're you're having players go on visits that are currently on your roster. They're leaving. All this is happening. You're preparing for a bowl game. You don't know who's on your roster. They they definitely are going to have to reevaluate uh, the timing of this because it's tough on the players. It's tough on the coaches. Um, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense uh, with why they have it uh, the way it is right now. But again, I I really feel like we're a year or two away from this whole thing just blowing up and. Yeah, probably that this new they're going to a 12 team playoff next year. I wouldn't be surprised if we live in this new world of like 50 or 60 teams and they almost branch away from the NCAA, kind of create their new own governing body and come up with a, a CBA with the players like they do in the NFL, uh, negotiate with the players, NIL, transfer portal, put some rules and regulation around it. Because right now there are no, there's no rules. Do whatever you want to do. Uh, boosters can get involved. People can pay people. It's just really chaotic right now. And I think until they get their arms around it, it'll continue to be that way. But my guess is another year or two until this thing, this thing will blow up on its on its own. Uh, one other kind of semi college football question. Got into this debate with Mike Florio the other day. 
um, about Jim Harbaugh as an NFL coach. And now, mm -hmm. so now that you've had a chance to be knee deep in the NFL for two years, doing the yeah. Thursday night games, being around all these teams, being around coaches, players, everything like that. I'm curious, you think Jim Harbaugh's game or, or Jim Harbaugh as a coach is better suited in college football or pro football? And do you think he might jump if he got the right offer? I, I personally think his game and his style fits, obviously, in college and pro. I mean, it wasn't like he struggled when he was in the pro game. I mean, he, right. he had a lot of success. Uh, I think he's a good coach. I know people like to have fun with him and, and talk about, you know, the way he is, uh, you know, with it, when he's in front of the media and some of the things he says. And how he's a little bit unusual with the character that he kind of has created. But I talk to his players a lot. And, man, they'd run through a wall for him. So he's doing something right. You know, and I think he in the college game, I think he really enjoys trying to fight, as he says, for the student athlete. Um, he feels that the student athletes deserve, as he says it, they deserve revenue sharing, which means not just NIL, but he's going to bat for them to try to get some of the TV money that's, you know, in the billions of dollars. And so I think there's part of him that really enjoys that, that, you know, the, the little guy taking on the, 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 the big bully, uh, so to speak. And I think that he really engages with the 18 to 22 year old. And I think he has their best interest in, in, in his heart. So I think that's real for him. I think he enjoys that part of it. I know every, every single offseason his name comes up, and it's because he was successful for the, with the 49ers and what he was able to do. So, I, Peter, it's hard for me to say, does he fit better in pros or college? Because I think his style of football and what he does, I think it fits in both. And, and I, I've really enjoyed these last two years doing the NFL because – you know, 10 or 15 years ago or even further back, the college game was always trying to come up to the NFL game and it would filter its way down to the college game. And the really good college programs, you would see Nick Saban running some of the stuff that Bill Belichick ran, or you might see some offensive coordinators running kind of the West Coast offense or the digit system or whatever it might be. And now, as you know, the, the, the college game has go, gone full circle. And I think once Andy Reid had success with Patrick Mahomes, um, and I think when when Lamar Jackson, who they was drafted, it's like, well, you're a running back, or you're no, you know, Jalen Hurts, what are you doing? You can't be a, a pro quarterback. And once these guys not only became NFL quarterbacks, but became very successful, I think we're in the midst right now of offensive coordinators trying to figure out how to run like a new style of offensive football, taking advantage of the legs and the arms of these quarterbacks, which is so different from Phillip Rivers, Drew Brees, Peyton Manning, Tom Brady, all those, that, that generation quarterback. It's almost like Aaron Rodgers is the last of that generation quarterback. And now we're going into the Patrick Mahomes era where it's like, you better be able to move or I don't know if you can play quarterback in today's game. So um, I think Harbaugh can coach that at the college level, but I understand why there's a lure every single off season. It's almost like he's already, everyone's just assuming he's going to be an NFL coach where that'll be. I have no idea, but um, I, I love his personality. He's a character in the college game. So I, I, I hope he stays at Michigan, but uh, I, I get it. If he goes on to the NFL. The, the, the reason why I ask honestly is that, what was it a year or two ago? I forget when. I think two years ago that he uh, he was interviewing for the Vikings job on National Signing Day, and I said, anybody who does that at some yeah. point, the guy's going back to the NFL. Yeah, I don't. I'm not saying that National Signing Day is some sacrilegious date. That if you're not sitting in your office, you know, getting the faxes or emails or whatever, you're you know. You're not doing your job. I I don't really know how it works, but I just thought that says to me that uh, Jim Harbaugh at one point is probably going to coach in the NFL, but we'll see. Yeah. Um, so I I we've got to talk about golden retrievers. Um, I uh, I read with great interest the story in the Athletic about you and your dog Ben and. Uh, 
I just, you know, obviously I follow you on social media and I see Ben all the time. And I said, nobody, I mean, Ben's a good dog. Okay. But Ben is your, and correct me if I'm wrong, your 10 year old golden. Yeah. And there's not a lot of goldens who fly on private planes, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and who, who go to all the biggest sports events and go to cool hotels and, and all that <laughs> stuff. But how did it start, Kirk, that you started taking your dog on the road with you? Well, we had we've had a tough a tough year on a personal front with my family. I have four sons and my my uh, I have identical twins that are twenty three, and my my twenty year old who just turned twenty one, Zach, is at Ohio State as a as a uh, preferred walk on. He plays tight end there, and uh, around the early part of June, he was coughing real badly and. Uh, got diagnosed with cardiomyopathy, enlarged left heart, uh, left ventricle yeah. of his heart. And it was really, really severe. And, um, you know, at, at one point we thought, you know, it, he may need a heart transplant. And so up to this point, it's it's holding steady. It's not improving. It's not getting any worse. But it's put a, a ton of stress on my wife and, and myself just being concerned about him. And, and right when we got our arms around, you know, his diagnosis, the season started up and it's my 28th year of doing this, you know, traveling and, and, and being away from my family. But it, this was a, this was a tough, uh, just a tough thing. And so around the middle of the year, um, not that my dog Ben would replace my son, but there was just something about taking him on the road just made me feel, um, you know, like it was part of home coming with me. And he is the most laid back, chilled companion you, you can ever hope for. Um, in fact, as we sit here and talk like this is if I'm if he's not traveling with me, he's 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 right there sleeping. Um, hey, so ben, wake up. This is really <laughs> interesting. Yeah, he, he's <laughs> I, <laughs> he's always with me. And, um, and anybody who has a dog, especially a retriever or a lab, probably can relate to that. And so he's my he's my buddy. And I traveled with him one time just as a one off. And it was it went so smoothly, you know, as far as the logistics of the hotel and getting him around um, that I just I inquired about um, making him an emotional support animal and, and went through three or four weeks of an evaluation, you know, and, and a Zoom call like this and. And uh, then they, they gave him a certificate. And so once they did that, I just I just started traveling with him. So he's been on the road with me now, probably the last. So that allows him to go into every hotel and all yeah. the buildings that normally a dog yeah. would be able to go into. That's very. Yeah. 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 And so he travels with me and, you know, I it, we've got our own routine now. And, you know, he's been to Chicago, New York City, Las Vegas. I mean, Athens, Georgia. I mean, all these different places and the pro stadiums, a lot of them that they, they have a rule. The dog can't uh, come into the pro stadium, the college stadiums. He comes out in the pregame warmups. He's no, <laughs> he's just walking around. The players are, you know, in their warmups and they see my golden retriever just hanging around it. They, they're full uniform. They come over and pet him, you know, and, um, in the hotels, it's the craziest thing. We were just in Las Vegas at our hotel, and and um, at first you're worried about it, and then they realize how friendly he is, and all the, the people that work at the hotel, they're coming over to him, and he he'll go on his own. You know, he'll leave me, and just if people are being nice to him, and I just go about my business, and I'm like the, the hotel. You should you should buy a dog like this and just let him hang out in the lobby because <laughs> yes, they're all over him. I mean, everybody because he just has. He just his tail's wagging and he's just kind of sitting there. So he's had a he's had a, a great time. It's been unbelievable uh experience uh for me. And I, I can't imagine I, I've got I'm going to LA this week uh for the Saints Rams game on Thursday. And then the following week we'll have the Jets and the Browns on Thursday, and then I'll fly to LA for the Rose Bowl. And the and the Rose Bowls, I'm going into their Hall of Fame this year. And they're like, you know, make sure you tell Kirk Ben has a credential, he's welcome here. And <laughs> so he'll be at the Rose Bowl and be on the field before the game, and he'll probably be in the booth while I'm calling the game. So yeah, it's it's been uh, it's been a lot of fun. But if the reaction on social media has been bizarre. I didn't even expect that, but clearly there's a bunch of of dog fans out there because anything you put out on Ben, people love to see. They just eat it up. I'm really curious about one kind of serious part of it. You know, the fact that he's an emotional support animal. You feel with the hardship in your family that 
you really needed a touch of home with you that you really feel like he's helped you mentally this year? No question. Um, you know, and you can relate to this as much as you travel. I think just, I mean, my son and what he's uh, dealing with right now, what we've dealt with as a family is one thing. But honestly, Peter, I, just being on the road a lot, you know, and people can talk about private planes and all that. It, it's still, you still are on the road and away from, you, you know, your family. And you're talking about, for me, I, I equate it to like from August to January 9th, I'm on a treadmill at about 15 miles an hour, not, not, not seven, eight, nine. I just feel like it's yeah. 15 miles an hour for four and a half months. I'm not complaining. I'm not saying woe is me. I'm just saying it's, it's a pretty good grind. And when you're away from your, your, uh, your family, it's, it's challenging, you know, and, and not to mention you live in the public eye and people, you know, have, have strong opinions about what you say or do. And, and, um, it's just something about having him with me. It does give me peace of mind. And, you know, as much as people have fun with it on social media and love watching him for me, when it's just me and him and it's quiet. Um, yeah, it gives me, uh, you know, it gives me a, I think a calming presence around me and I just love having him with me. And he's, you know, I've had a lot of dogs. I have four dogs actually right now. And, and he, of all my dogs, he's just, He's just different, you know. He, I, I, I don't, I don't know what it is about him. My other, my other dogs are wonderful, but Ben is just a. It's like, it's like he's part human. It's like he understands me. I can, you know, he can relate to everything I'm experiencing. Um, and if you're a dog person, maybe you get that. Uh, but for me, he's he's just my companion, and and I'm, I'm I look at it like he's a blessing, honestly, in my life. Uh. Tell me a little bit about Zach now. How's he doing? How's his physical condition right now? He he uh, just had a test yesterday on his on his uh, VO2 to find out if he's improved, and and he's he had some improvement, which was great. His ejection fraction, uh, which which really looks at the the heart and its function, it's very very low at this point. Uh, the size of the heart is uh, very, very large, but it has come down a little bit, which is good. At least it's it's heading in the right direction. He's on about five or six different meds and has been now for for about four months. And so we're just going to continue the same process for as long as it takes. We we hope we, there's really no way other than we know it's um, hereditary the gene that he has um, it's on my side of the family. Other than knowing that we don't know because we didn't have a prior diagnosis. So we don't know if he was, you know, had this for a few years or if he had it after around COVID. We have no idea except the size of it would tell you that it didn't happen within, you know, the previous months. I think it's been that yeah. way for, for a long time. So it's going to, for it to heal, if it does, it will take, uh, you know, a, a substantial amount of time, but, it's not getting worse. Uh, they did put a defibrillator in him uh, just a few weeks ago. And because up to that point, he had a portable, like they called a life vest that he had on 24 seven. So he had to wear it everywhere under his clothes. Now he actually, they inserted one underneath his left side of his, uh, of his arm. And so, um, you know, he's got a very positive attitude. Um, you know, he, he's, He's kind of that way. He's a glass half full guy. I'm a glass half empty guy, I, but he is a glass half full guy. So he he's uh, he's remaining positive. And I'll tell you, being a part of the Ohio State football program with Ryan Day, they let him travel this year. The Big Ten gave him a waiver to allow him to be a part of it. So he's been to all the games and they've given him a job to be just feel like he's still part of it because his career is over. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it, all things considered, it's you know, he's hanging in there. Uh, Peanut Tillman, by the way, bumped into me in Chicago and he, he told me about his daughter who, who now I think is 15 or 16, but she had a heart transplant uh, as an infant. And he wow. just, he, he sought me out at, on the field before a game that Al and I were there on a Thursday night, just could not have been a nicer guy. This blew me away. I, I've known about him as a player, but uh, man, as, as just a, a gentleman and as a guy, you know, when you're going through something like this, just little pieces of, hey, I knew somebody that went through this or my daughter went through this. It just kind of gives you something to hang on to for hope. And so that that's been, you know, bumping into people like that. Greg Olson, another guy that's been through a lot. Yeah. Himself. So 
um, it, that 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 part really helped a lot. Getting around this, you realize you realize that this this week is the five year anniversary that Matt Millen had a heart transplant. I didn't know it was a five year. Wow! And he's wow. really doing well. That's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. I remember when he got diagnosed, and at the time, I know we were all, you know, worried that uh, yeah. that you do. And before I knew about heart transplants, when I heard, when I hear heart transplant, I think, oh no, you know. And and now right. that you know, now that you research it a little bit, you realize uh, the incredible work that these doctors do and the technology and how far it's advanced. So that's that's great to hear about Matt. I have to reach out to him. I got one more dog related question. I think you can now tell America that you named your new puppy after me. <laughs> after you. <laughs> that's true. That's a good call. Little <laughs> little Peter. Yeah, it is after you. I How'd you it. pick the name? That's a I mean, I look, our dog's name is Chuck, but <laughs> which is kind of a dog name. Yeah, that is a good dog name. Yeah. My, yeah. My wife and my kids, we I think we just get a kick out of uh, you know, we have Ben, we have Theo, we have Mitch, and uh, and, and you know, and now we have Pete, Peter or Pete. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I don't like my kids and I. We all just kind of bounce. It was it was close to being Jeff, and I I forget the names that they were they were talking about. Kevin, I think, was a name, and <laughs> and then we so finally great. settled settled on uh, on Pete or yeah. Peter. Yeah. All right, so Kirk, we got to ask. I got to ask you two things about the NFL now. So yeah. you've had two years in it. Tell me what, if anything, has surprised you. Probably, there's probably not anything that's a huge shock, but what surprised you over the last couple of years? Now that you have been totally kind of inculcated with NFL ness, what what hits you? I think the thing that that really stands out to me and I've been an NFL fan my whole life, but now when you prepare, like right now, I'm, you know, I've got my boards in front of me. I, I'm, you know, I, I've got my own routine that I, that I do every week to prepare. The thing that stands out to me, I think is the, where we are as a sport with back, a lot of tension goes on the backup quarterbacks. I think what I've been blown away by is the discrepancy between the offensive line play and the injuries that are inevitable and the jump to the defensive line and how dominant the defensive line is in versus the offensive line with the exception yeah. of, I mean, you could go down the Cowboys and the 49ers and the Eagles. I mean, there's a, there's a few that, that are healthy and they're really talented, but while everybody wants to talk about these backup quarterbacks, Every single week, it seems like Al and I are talking about, okay, the left guard is out, so they had to move the right guard over to left guard. The center went over to this. They found a right tackle who retired, and they brought him back to play. It's just I, I'm really amazed with the lack of availability of competent offensive linemen um, and, and how rare it is to find six or seven guys on a roster – that um, that can remain healthy and they can give you a cohesion front to give these yeah. quarterbacks and these offensive coordinators who get ripped from limb to limb. What's wrong with this quarterback? What's wrong with this coordinator? When all you really have to do is look what's happening in front of them. And the Saints, who I have this week, are a really good example. Derek Carr, he's terrible. What happened to Derek Carr? It's like, well, they can't run the ball. The offensive line has really struggled. And all of a sudden, these last three or four weeks, they're getting a little bit better up front, getting better play, becoming a little more of a solid unit. And all of a sudden, Derek Carr's playing better football. So I think that's the thing that's really stood out to me is um, how pedestrian the, the offensive line play is because of injuries and, and the lack of depth. And then they're going up against, to me, the, the most gifted and most athletic position in the game that again often gets overlooked and which is the defensive line play did you when you um over the last i guess it would have been 19 to 22 maybe 18 to, i'm sorry 18 to 21 did you ever do an iowa state game did you ever do a brock purdy game and if so Give me a little window into what you thought when you watched tape on him and what you thought when you watched him play. 
I, I would be lying to you if I said he's going to go to the 49ers and, and he's going to become and light it up. What, yeah. yeah, what he is. Yeah. But I, I would tell you, I do tell you this, that he played for a, a head coach that a lot of people in the college game have a, a ton of respect for, Matt Campbell. Matt Campbell, yeah. He, he, he played in a system that I don't think he had to change much of the way they ran their operation for four years, freshman year. Think about being a freshman and you're playing Oklahoma and Texas and all these big programs. And as a, as a 19 year old and a 20 year old and 21 and 22, he was the face of a perennial loser in the big right. 12 that he led to becoming a winner. And, and, and he was along for the entire ride of some ups and some downs. So I think his experience and the way they ran the, their strength and conditioning program, and you got to go to class and you need to be on time, like, very efficient operation. And I think when he, as luck would have it, he ends up falling into Kyle Shanahan's system and John Lynch's system. And I think it was almost like, okay, four years of college, it probably felt like he's still to a certain degree in Ames, Iowa, based on how they run their operation. It was an extension of what he did at Iowa State. He was undersized, athletic, um, ball was out. He was a guy that had the ability to process. The ball would get out quickly. Um, he played so many games, like, you know, and, and some big time atmospheres in college football where there's 80,000, 100,000 people there on national TV. So I think when he got to the NFL, the one question was, could he learn Kyle Shanahan's system? And could he process the complexity of NFL defenses and how much there is, because that was a strength of his in college. And it's impossible to predict if a college quarterback will be able to, to jump to the NFL, learn that new system, and then react as quickly and, and as efficiently as he did in college. That's why a lot of guys miss on trying to find that quarterback. And this guy's Mr. Irrelevant. You just never know. But this, this kid's mind and the system that he's in, I think he understands it. He sees it. And then he brings some intangibles. He's not a rah-rah guy, but he's got enough edge to him and a chip on his shoulder that I think his teammates seem to really be rallying around in the NFL because I certainly know they did when he was in college. It's interesting. The I covered the game that was sort of his coming out party when Jimmy Garoppolo broke his foot against Miami in that big game mm -hmm. early December a year ago. And he came in, he widened the lead, and the 49ers won that game going away. It was a shock to everybody. And after the game, I said to him, Brock, big day for you, but a bigger day is coming. Next week, your first start in the NFL here at Levi's Stadium, you'll be playing Tom Brady. I said, how do you feel about that? He said, in a voice I can best describe as flatline. Oh, cool. He's been playing football longer than I've been alive. <laughs> and it was like, you know, it reminds me a little bit of the way Tommy DeVito is with the Giants now. We can all sit here and say, oh, my God, it's ridiculous what he did and won three starts and beat the Packers on Monday Night Football. But Tommy DeVito's whole point is, hey, I've been playing football since I've been five since I was five years old. I belong. It's not a shock to me. And and I, I this is I want to end this, Kirk, but I and I want to ask you this one thing. For those who who don't know this, who only know Kirk Curb Street as a TV guy, um, you know, I I distinctly remember this because I you know, going to Ohio University in the late 70s, I became kind of a big fan of the Ohio State-Michigan rivalry. And I remember the game you played, I think it was in about 92. If I'm not mistaken, it was a tie. One of the few ties at all. Was that was that a tie game you played against yeah. Michigan? Yeah. Right. So... <clears throat> Uh, so anyway, but I, I remember because I knew I I, I, we, I knew we were going to talk today and I was racking my brain. And anyway, 
And I wrote this note in my column, and it's going to be a weird thing to end on because it's not re it's not about you, but it's about expertise that you have. Okay, it's a note from my column this week about Justin Herbert, and here's the note: In four years of college football at Oregon, Justin Herbert had three head coaches, three offensive coordinators. Two guys shared the job one season and two quarterback coaches. In four years of pro football with the Chargers, Herbert's had three head coaches, three offensive coordinators, and three quarterback coaches, which all means that Herbert, who will be 26 years old in 2024, his ninth season in college and pro football, he's very likely to have his seventh head coach his seventh offensive coordinator and sixth quarterback coach. And I just sort of shake my head and say, you talk about, and again, it's too strong to say you're ruining this poor guy. But for somebody who was in the belly of the beast, who had to learn this very, very, a very, very complex offense, I'm sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. Imagine learning that seven times in nine years. And I just want to ask you what you think when you hear that, what you think for Justin Herbert? Well, I don't think it's an accident when you look at the quarterbacks and you look at the people who stand on the podium at the end of the year and the confetti's coming down and, and they've won a championship. The continuity at some point has got to be a factor and whether it's the defensive side of the ball, the way the Ravens did way back with Ray Lewis, and they had a lot of pieces that had been around and knew each other. They knew the intangibles. They knew the, the checks without even having to say the checks. And the same thing could be said for, for what Tom Brady has done or go back to John Elway. I mean, you name a quarterback. Very often, it's because the system that they understood, it, almost like they're taking a breath. That's how quickly they understand where what to yeah. do with the football. And Justin Herbert, to me, is uberly talented. I can't tell you how many games that I called in his years and he was in Eugene. And we always would walk away from him, think walking away from a game from him, just talking about his physical skill set. But another guy that I probably would not have said when he was done playing in Eugene, he's going to go to the NFL and he's going to take that, you know, that position by storm and let people know how, how dominant he can be. He was a good player. But there was just something there that that you wondered, did he have it? Like when I watched Tom Brady, right? Tom Brady had it. You could see it at Michigan. You may not say right. he's going to go win seven Super Bowls, but there was just something that like Drew Brees, there's just games on the line. I want him. I want him in charge. I want him to find a way to win the game. Like you just knew, may not do it all the time, but yeah, I want him to have the ball. Herbert in college, I never really felt like that. He he just kind of had a, I don't want to say lazy, fair attitude, but he just a passive he just, guy in some ways. Yeah. Yeah. Just kind of like, you know, if, if it's there, I'll find a way. And if it's not, you know, we'll get him next time kind of thing. And I, and I don't mean to be critical of him. It's just, that was his personality. So I wondered if he could do it in the NFL and early in his career. Wow. He, he, he definitely showed me and everybody that he, that he had that, but my concern for him, what you're describing at some point, and I just had the Chargers. At some point, you have to realize that the pieces around him are going to be everything. You know, like you, you look at Keenan Allen, he's like 31 or 32. Yeah. You know, and, and you look at Eckler and you just they, they've got some big decisions to make, not only who their coach is going to be, but what's the nucleus going to look like around him so he can grow. The one thing I love Jacksonville, what they did with Trevor Lawrence, once they realized we got something that's unique at the quarterback position. They went out and got guys like Christian Kirk and Evan Ingram, and they decided we're going to load this while we have him. We're going to load these positions around him, and we're going to shoot for the stars. They got to do that with Herbert, you know. So you got to find a coordinator. You got to find a head coach, and and I know you always want to find that. But God, can you imagine what Herbert could do if he had the same running back, the same right. three or four receivers, and the same system to grow? for the next four or five, six years. And that's how you become exceptional. And then that, and that's how you become a threat every single year to be a, to be a team that can make a run in the postseason. And, and you know what you, what you mentioned too in there that I think is so vitally important. I covered the 
Patriots in Kansas City on Sunday in Foxborough. And after the game, I'm sitting there talking to Andy Reid. Uh, and we were talking about this play that they uh, scored on in a scoreless game late in the first quarter. Matt Nagy brought it to, to Reid. Uh, they called it Heisman. It's an old uh, Columbia Penn uh, play with all this different motion and everything. Yeah, I saw it, yeah. And, and yeah. So anyway, but it was a cool play. And it was totally different. And, you know, I've talked to Mahomes a lot over the years, and he has told me one of the things I love about playing for Andy Reid is that if you bring an idea to him and he thinks it can work, he's going to not only embrace it, he's going to use it at a big point in a game. And when you play the Patriots, Andy Reid is like a fanboy when he talks about Belichick. He really is. And Andy Reid was, you know, they're not getting anything done on offense and struggling a little bit. So, hey, let's call Heisman. That's what they call the play. <laughs> and they run it and they score. And so I find out later, uh, you know, Andy gave me a couple little breadcrumbs to look into in his locker room and you know, to call a couple of people. And I ended up texting with Matt Nagy. And Matt Nagy basically said, uh, hey, listen, the center on this play was Joe Tooney. And Joe Tooney, who had not played any center in, in four years or three years, one of the reasons was Patrick Mahomes said, hey, this guy's going home. He played for New England for five years. Let's let's feature him. Let's let's give him a little shine here. Let's do something. So he practices snapping. Nagy goes to Andy Reid and says, "Let's have let's have uh, Tooney snap the ball." You know, five years with the Patriots, and so Tooney's excited about it. And he made a perfect snap. They scored a touchdown, and nobody really knew it because it just it just totally came out of the blue. But my point is, my point yeah. is. Patrick Mahomes has a comfort level with his coaches. Now Nagy's his offensive coordinator, and obviously before it was Eric Bieniemy. Uh, he could say anything to those guys at any time. He can say anything to Andy Reid at any time, and there is this comfort level. And that, when I was putting this note together about Justin Herbert, I just kept thinking to myself. He can't have that. Mm -mm. He just got to know his new coaches 10 yeah. minutes ago. I yeah. mean, Kellen Moore, he just gets to know this off season. And now Kellen Moore is probably going to get whacked, you know, yeah. with whoever the new coach is. And it's just, I just keep thinking to myself, I, I hate to say it because, you know, shoot, he's got a $261 million contract. But to a guy like Justin Herbert, as you know, and I know him a little bit, he could give a flying squirrel about all this money, you know, yeah. he just really wants to be good at his job and man, it's been real tough. So I don't know. I just figured because you were there, you yeah. were in his shoes, you would know what it's like to have yeah. seven different offensive systems. Yeah. 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 And, and you know what, honestly, I'm just being honest with you. That's what makes you who you are and what you've created and your brand individually mm -hmm. is See, I'm a football guy. I find what you just described to me fascinating. So like when I'm reading through your notes, I I love because it takes it takes an individual behind. I'm going to go back to Kansas City behind the curtain to a certain degree about what makes Andy Reid, Andy Reid, because it's not just oh, he's got great players. He's calling great plays. You you just touched on something about the culture there and, and Matt Nagy could be it used to be Eric Bieniemy. It could be the receiver coach. Maybe looked at some film on something from 1952. Yeah. And he wanted, anybody can bring anything in. Yeah, and they, and they don't feel like oh, there's no way Andy won't he won't care about. It. He's just got a way about him. And he shared some of that with Al and I when we had uh, Kansas City because we were all saying, "What do you have up your sleeve?" This and he and he started to talk a little bit about you know how he lets guys bring stuff in and we kind of mess around with it. And if it works, we end up using it. And I just thought, wow, that that's pretty cool. And the fact that he gets Joe excited and Patrick's excited, they're all bought into 
him going back to New England. And, and I, I just, I think that's, um, I know you're talking about Herbert. I just love that you're able to tell those kind of stories because guys like you and I get a chance to talk to these people and get to hear it. But I think it's cool to be able to express that and, and tell people um, that there's more to Kansas City than just having a great quarterback and Andy Reid calling these great plays. It's um, it's pretty fascinating when you can get NFL players who make millions and tens of millions of dollars. You can still get them excited about one of their teammates getting a snap of football on a play called Heisman, and they buy in. You know, it's it's cool. I love that. Hey, you know, and the other thing, I'm walking out of the stadium last night, and I just said to myself, man. I don't get this great feel about the Chiefs this year. I just don't. Yeah. You know, there are things, yeah. you know, when you're really relying on Kadarius Tony, I'd be a little bit worried. But but anyway, anyway, the reason that I brought that up is I just thought to myself, you know, any other team right now is on the way to being six and eleven or whatever with with yeah. all these issues. But you got this great quarterback. You've got a coach who really gets people to feel like, hey, listen, it's all of us. We mm -hmm. all have a hand in this. And I just said, you know, if if anybody, if any team in the NFL this year can come out of this funk, I think it's Kansas City. Do I think they will? Probably not. But if they do... I don't think anybody should be all that surprised. You know? <laughs> I'm with you. I'm with you. The fact that you have Patrick Mahomes and, and these receivers, it's it's become an issue. But you and I both know at any moment, Kelsey could become Kelsey. Yeah. Mahomes could become Mahomes. And they're an upset or two away in the first round of the playoffs. Next thing you know, they're in the AFC Championship on the road at Miami or Baltimore or wherever they are. Been there and done that. And just, I'm not saying, I'm with you. I'm not saying it's a, they're going to do it. Yeah. But if they did you'd sit there and say only Andy Reid and only Patrick Mahomes can do that. Somebody with the Chiefs made this point to me because I was asking about the circus with Taylor Swift and all yeah. that other stuff. And he goes, well, he said, honestly, it's really not a bad thing for us because, you know, there's so many people who are now, like at the press conference yesterday with Andy Reid after the game, there's a reporter from I don't know where I maybe people maybe entertainment tonight who said to Andy, "What is it like to have Taylor Swift around your team and all that?" And you know, I mean, Andy Reid is not the best one to answer a question about Taylor <laughs> Swift, but he actually likes Taylor Swift. Yeah, you know, he loves Kelsey. But anyway, yeah. it's just I don't know. It's sort of a fun time and. Yeah. Andy Reid, for as many problems and, and issues as he's had with his kids and his personal life, yeah. he is one optimistic dude who is fun to be around. That's all I can. That's all I tell people, you know, yeah. to just be around this guy. So, yeah. 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 And I and I think it, it really, if nothing else, it sure is setting itself up for an exciting postseason. You know, oh, yeah. Miami's become this kind of the shiny new toy and if they end up getting home field advantage you know how tough that can be you know for for them by you know trying to go down there and beat them you got Baltimore with Lamar and what he's doing in the AFC NFC appears to be wide open with Dallas at home they're one team on the road they're another um it's wide open you know it's not like you have two teams and everybody else yeah it's going to be a wide open race that's one of the things Andy Reid said to me yesterday and we're recording this on Monday Andy Reid said to me he goes the the parody this year compared to every other year is just unbelievable. I I honestly don't know. We go into every game and I don't know what's going to happen. And he goes, that definitely has not been the case all along here. So anyway, yeah. it does make for a lot of fun. Hey, yeah. uh, Kirk, I've kept you far, far too long. I appreciate it. Thanks. And what's Ben doing right now? Ben is still sound asleep back here. Hey, Ben, good dog. Good dog. <laughs> oh, he doesn't care. He, he just responds care. to your voice. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Hey, it was a pleasure talking to you, Kirk. Thanks a lot. Best of hey, luck, okay? Hey, as you, I told you, big fan, man. Keep up the great work. Really appreciate your efforts and, and all the stories you tell. Hey, thanks a million. I do appreciate it. Okay, see you, bud. Take care. My thanks, obviously, to Kirk Herbstreet for a really interesting discussion. 
And Miles, as we get into, we head into the last three weeks of the season, what's amazing to me is, you know, when I saw a snippet of Football Night in America uh, on Sunday evening, I'm looking at the odds and Steve Kornacki, uh, playoff odds, is not altogether into the Bills making the playoffs. And I just thought to myself, wow, after watching the Bills play the last couple of weeks, I, I mean, not that they're a playoff lock, but, but then you understand the logic behind it. First of all, <clears throat> Buffalo is two games behind Miami. And even though Miami has Dallas and Baltimore in the next two weeks, and they could lose one or both of those, the last game of the season, Buffalo at Miami. And so I understand why, uh, you know, Steve Kornacki and some, many, are thinking that this is still a tough road for Buffalo to the playoffs. But Miles Simmons, if they get there, I think right now, today, this moment, this is one of the top three teams in football. One of the most dangerous three teams in football. And I would not want to play the Buffalo Bills in January if I were an AFC playoff foe. I would not either, especially the way that they showed their dominance in the run game um, in that victory over the Cowboys on Sunday. I mean, they, they were just absolutely dominant. And Josh Allen, you know, talking about, I feel like the kid doing the group project who did nothing and still got an A. And, you know, a lot of people were saying, <laughs> oh, we've all been that guy. I'm telling you, Peter, I'm sorry. I've never been that guy. I was the guy that was always doing all the work. And I didn't usually like the people that didn't do much and still got an A because of me. But I digress. I think that the Bills certainly are a dangerous team, you know. And when Josh Allen is playing in the way where he's unleashed, you know, and he's not really turning the ball over, he's playing clean football, these are the types of things that you like to see from him. This is the kind of potential that I think we all know that he has, even when they're just running the crap out of the football Josh Allen's still making good decisions. You know, he's still making checks in the run game. And those are the things you need from your quarterback. So, yeah, I, I also don't think that any AFC team would want to see them in January. But at the same time, as I have been telling my buddy who's from Buffalo, it's still an uphill climb. You know, there are a lot of teams that they have to jump. And whether it's Miami in that division, and yeah, Miami could lose one of these next two and make that week 18 game for the division, or Buffalo could trip up in one of their next few games. I mean, it, there's no guarantees there, but they are playing great football right now. There's there's no denying that. It's just kind of a shame that their lull throughout the year has put them in this position where they could end up on the outside looking in at the playoff picture. I said to somebody from Cincinnati over the weekend after what I thought was a really, really impressive win for the Bengals against Minnesota, coming back from down 17 to three, <clears throat> where at that moment they're down 17 to three. And Brian Flores' defense with Minnesota has gone 29 series in a row without allowing a touchdown. Yeah. And what does Jake Browning do? He goes touchdown, 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 and then they win the game in overtime. Tremendous job. All the respect in the world for last week's podcast guest, Jake Browning, and for uh, the coach of the Bengals and the coaching staff, quite honestly, Zach Taylor, Brian Callahan, quarterback coach Dan Pitcher, doing a great job. But my point that I was going to make is every week, counts mm -hmm. and I just want you to just want to kind of remind you a little bit when probably a month ago we were all saying well Bengals are done you know they lost three in a row they lost Joe Burrow and all that and now obviously they've beaten three strong playoff contenders Jacksonville Indianapolis and Minnesota and to those who would say Bengals are a fluky playoff contender right now. I'm not convinced. I don't love them. I'm just going to say one thing. Every week counts. And do you realize, do you remember the consecutive weeks? 
about five, six weeks ago when the Cincinnati Bengals went to Santa Clara and beat the 49ers, went Mm -hmm. back home and beat the Buffalo Bills on national TV. And I realize Joe Burrow's gone, but you know what? It is just the lesson. Every game counts. You're the Buffalo Bills and you say, oh my God, they're one of the best teams in football. Uh, They got to make it. Here's what I would say to Buffalo Bills fans. Yes, you are one of the best teams in football, but you lost to the Jets. You lost to the Patriots. You handed, handed a primetime game to the Denver Broncos. Yep. So I don't want to hear any whining at the end of the year if you're a Buffalo Bills fan. Yes, you're one of the best teams in football right now, but your performance in a two- or three-week period is not and should not be what determines it. This is not the college football playoffs where you have people voting (laughs) for who, who the best teams are. You know, this in the NFL, Florida State would be in the playoffs, Miles Simmons. So I just wanted to get all that out of the way. So three other quick things. I'm tired of the Dallas Cowboys. Just really tired of the Dallas Cowboys. And I thought a week ago, probably like everyone, that that was a statement win for the Cowboys over the Philadelphia Eagles. And I thought, okay, they're going to win. They're going to be really competitive down the stretch. They'll win one of these two road games at Buffalo, at Miami, and they'll be in good shape because then, you know, their, their schedule evens out a bit. Detroit at home where they play really well, and then they play Washington to end the season. So I just thought to myself, okay, Cowboys are going to be on the right path. Well, then... You watch the Dallas Cowboys, and in the game in Buffalo, with their whole season on the line, the first 50 minutes of this game, I'm going to tell you about the Buff- the Dallas Cowboys. In a game they absolutely, unequivocally had to have. They go, punt, punt, field goal, punt, 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 interception. Down 31-3, to three, ball game over, slink back to the team plane, go home, and feel about as dejected as you had to feel slinking back home after the game against San Francisco in week five, where you lose by 32. This loss was just as bad and perhaps even more important. I I think it's a worse loss, frankly, Peter, because at some point over the last few weeks, and I can't remember quite what it, when it was, Dak Prescott had said that that loss to San Francisco that they had, you know, it was one of those games where you got the wake up call and you felt like you never wanted to get that feeling again over the course of the season. And look what they do. They go to Buffalo. It's December football. All right. You're going to have to win at some point on the road. You know it. And you have an opportunity (coughs) to solidify yourself as one of the top teams in football going against one of the hottest teams in football. And they just were not ready for the moment. You know, I don't understand why you have such a discrepancy in the way that the Cowboys play on home at home versus when they're on the road. But that's something that they needed to solve weeks ago. And now they've got to solve it immediately because if they can't play on the road, then they're going to have a really big problem trying to make things happen in the postseason. It's just the way it's going to be. They ain't going to win home field advantage. So at some point, you're either going to have to go to Philadelphia. You're going to have to go to Santa Clara again. And I don't know how they're going to react to that because of the way they played against Buffalo. I mean, this is a huge matchup now with Miami on the road, right? Are you going to be able to cover Tyreek Hill if he's back or just Jalen Waddle? I don't know. I mean, how are you going to be able to stop that run game when you couldn't stop a team that's really not run the ball well historically? You know, with Josh Allen, yeah, I know he's the battering ram, but you got Cook and you let him go for as many as he went for. How are you going to react to that? I'm really interested to see how the Cowboys react here because this is a team that we know is actually good, right? Dak Prescott has played great football at home. So how do you then take that on the road? How do you react these last three games? 
How do you improve yourself and actually make sure that something like that debacle in Buffalo doesn't happen again? They've got to be able to do it. I mean, otherwise it's like, you know, you're saying in our text, you, you got to use the restroom or just get off the pot. Cause at, th- at this point you either <laughs> are able to do it or you're not. I- I'm sorry. Like I, I, I think that the Cowboys should be better than they are. And there's no excuse at this point. Miles Simmons, as of this moment today, I'm totally befuddled about the MVP. I truly don't know who I would vote for right now. And that's why I love this is an 18-week award, not a 15-week award. So let's leave the MVP discussion for down the road a bit. But to me, I've started to get some clarity about Coach of the Year. I'll give you my top three right now. Number one, Kevin Stefanski, Cleveland. Number two, D'Amico Ryans, Houston. Number three, Dan Campbell, Detroit. And look, there's 10 other guys who deserve some credit, deserves pra- deserve praise. But right now, Kevin Stefanski uh, with, by the way, his lookalike, Joe Flacco. I mean, <laughs> if they sit in a team meeting, I have a question. They sit next to each other. You walk in there. How do you know which one is the coach and which one is the starting quarterback? I, I, I don't you know, to me, the facial hair just totally makes it impossible because the facial hair is exactly the same. But I just really applaud Stefanski. He's won this year with four different starting quarterbacks, four different winning starting quarterbacks. They're nine and five with an incredible amount of anxiety and difficulties. And look, Miles, as of now, You and I still don't know if 40% into the contractual term of Deshaun Watson, whether the Cleveland Browns actually have their quarterback of the future when they step on the field for opening day of training camp 2024. I have no idea if he's done enough to assuage any of the doubters or or whatever. I, I still think there's an open question about it, but... That's a question for another day. Right now, to me, if you're a Cleveland Browns fan, you got to be really, really happy with what your team has shown under this coach who just doesn't let anything really bug him. Yeah, it's been unbelievable what Kevin Stefanski has been able to do. I was talking to my mom, who's still in Cleveland, and she likened him to MacGyver with the way that he was able to get through that game against the Chicago Bears. Because look, I mean, they were playing without four or five starting offensive linemen. You have an incredible amount of the salary cap that is tied up in some of these players that are on injured reserve. And you've got Joe Flacco throwing absolute dimes in the fourth quarter to guys like Amari Cooper and Marquise Goodwin. I mean, it was kind of ridiculous what Joe Flacco was able to do in that final period of that game against the Bears to win it. So, yeah, you know, it's the first time that a coach for the Cleveland Browns has had multiple winning seasons since Marty Schottenheimer in the 80s. That's before I was even born. So it tells you the kind of job that Kevin Stefanski has done for that franchise. You know, going into this year, you talk about the Deshaun Watson contract. It was kind of an open question, right? If, If this thing doesn't start taking off, well, is Kevin Stefanski going to be the coach of the Cleveland Browns going forward? Because you're not really going to get rid of Deshaun Watson. But I think right now we know that Kevin Stefanski should be the head coach of the Cleveland Browns going forward because of what he has done and what he's been able to do with that team as a whole, just keeping them competitive and having them in position, not just to compete for a playoff spot, but potentially if Baltimore slips, they could be competing for that division title in the last couple of weeks. You know, I want to end with, and again, there's a lot of things we could talk about this week. I mean, an amazing matchup coming up uh, with San Francisco hosting Baltimore on Christmas night. Um, But I I wanted to leave you, Miles, with one thought after uh, covering Kansas City at New England, just about one of the reasons why, even though Kansas City looks incredibly flawed right now, uh, their receivers, Patrick Mahomes' receivers, have dropped seven more balls than any other quarterback has been victimized 
by his receiver group this year. Um, and, 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 and so there's a lot of reasons to not like Kansas City. But one of the things that I walk away from there really thinking is not only that, hey, never doubt Patrick Mahomes, obviously, but the way they actually won this game, they won this game when they were really scratching and clawing and struggling a little bit late in the first quarter, scoreless game. And Andy Reid calls a play that Matt Nagy, the offensive coordinator, had brought to him uh, from the 1940s. It's a total misdirection, weird play. When you look at even the way that the players were lined up, if you look at Patrick Mahomes in a three-point stance, quite literally, for the first time since he ran the 40 at the scouting combine. But if you look at the kind of three-point stance... It's an ancient NFL three-point stance. The players on this team basically imitated a play from a Penn Columbia game back in the World War II era of football, basically 80 years ago. And the only reason I bring this up is that the Kansas City Chiefs are a smart, imaginative team And the players on that team love the imagination, the fact that even when we're struggling, we can pull something out that will totally confound the great Belichick and this great defense. And I'm going to say this right now. I think that is a great defense in New England. That is a hard-to-figure defense. Uh, and, And so the Kansas City Chiefs, did something with basically their season on the line and imagination won that game. And I just really think that it says a lot about the state of this team, the state of this quarterback, the state of this coaching staff, just a lot to like. And look, I'm not blind to the problems. They have big problems, but they pulled out a bizarro play with Mahomes and Jarek McKinnon doing crazy misdirection stuff. And McKinnon, an option quarterback in college, throwing a touchdown pass, just a touchdown toss, you know, to basically start them on this win that they had to have. Miles, I I just wanted to throw out that observation that I don't know what's going to happen to Kansas City, but if they lose... It's not because they're not trying to pull everything out to try to do everything humanly possible to win games. Uh, Absolutely. And look, when you've got a quarterback like Patrick Mahomes, anything is possible. You know, once you get to the postseason and a guy with that kind of experience and that kind of skill, you know, it's hard to bet against Patrick Mahomes. But the thing that has been his letdown is, as you mentioned, is the unreliable receiving core that he has. And so I think that there's got to be some level of frustration with that. And I think that that's very understandable. But when you look at Kansas City, they they don't have a, the toughest schedule going down the stretch, which is good. Right. Um, they will have to play the Bengals. but And we've seen Jake Browning pull out victories. So that's not something that you can completely discount. Um, but I, I do think that once they get to the postseason, and I think we all anticipate them winning the division, that they're going to be dangerous because they have Patrick Mahomes. But I'll throw it back to you with this, Peter. What would you do with Kadarius, Tony? Well, <clears throat> I asked Andy Reid about that. I said, how can you continue to stick with him? And he said, he's a young guy with great talent. Miles. In an average year, I think Kadarius Tony, for at least a week or two, would be deactivated by Andy Reid. But you tell me, what other receiver on this team can stretch the field and sort of put the fear in defenses? There really isn't one. He, this is a 4-3-9-40 guy. And right now, today, with a bunch of other mediocre weapons at wide receiver, this is still a guy who, if he can simply 
stop making these big errors could be a really vital piece. I get it. I have had enough of Kadarius, Tony. I would try to win. Isaiah Pacheco probably comes back this week for the last three weeks of this year. I just try to run the crap out of the ball. That's what I would do. But Andy Reid understands that at some point you're going to need deep speed. He's the only guy they got. So I think that is what they're going to do. As for what I would do, he'd be deactivated this week at the very least. Yeah, I mean, that's what I would do too. I mean, I, I think at a certain point, you're just too you're too unreliable to be out there. You know, if Mahomes can't trust you to catch the ball and he can't even trust you to line up in the right spot, I mean, what? it's all at a certain point, what are we doing? I mean, they've got guys in uh, Richie James and Watson's made a couple plays, but he's not also not the most reliable. You know, Justin Ross may be coming back, may not be. We'll see what they can do with yeah. Nicole Hardman at some point. Uh, but it's just, and Sky Moore goes to IR now with knee swelling. So it, it's tough. You don't have that many options. I wonder if with Pacheco coming back, if Clyde Edwards Alaire maybe starts becoming more like a Christian McCaffrey and he plays in the slot. Cause Hey, he made a darn good leap and catch in the end zone. And so, Hey, if you've got hands, right. Somebody's got to be out there. And to I place. totally agree. There was some talk about that after the game that they're going to need to get, even if Pacheco comes back, they're going to need to keep Clyde Edwards Hilaire on the field because right now he's one of their best playmakers. So anyway, yeah. we shall see. Miles Simmons, thanks a lot for the conversation this week. We had some fun. We solved a lot of the world's problems, and I'm much appreciative uh, of your help all the time. I want to wish you a Merry Cleveland Christmas. I will be having a Merry Christmas in Berkeley, California, taking the weekend off from writing this column for the first time in 26 years. So, anyway, it's going to be interesting. I wonder if I'll get pangs of withdrawal. I don't know. But we will see you right back here for the podcast again next week. Enjoy Christmas. And everybody out there, please enjoy your holidays. Watch some football. Have some fun. R-E-L-A-X. Relax, enjoy your families. Thanks a lot for joining us on the Peter King Podcast. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.